Hello, St. James. My name is Fernando, and I'm a member of your church. Uh, I'm from Mexico, so please bear with my accent, especially because this presentation is going to be big, very big. So what is the purpose of this talk? In my case, I wanted to do this, this talk because it really helped me to deepen my faith, to, to know more about Jesus and about his sacrifice for us. And also something that they mention a lot, people mention a lot, is that it seems like religion, we have blind faith. And here, I mean, this couldn't be farther from the truth. We have facts, science, history, they're all in our side and we shouldn't be afraid of using them. Christianity hinges on the resurrection. And the Apostle Paul understood this. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. We have no hope. We're lost. And he understood this. He gave his life for it. So he believed it. So, did Jesus rise from the dead? Short answer? Yes. Long answer? Yes. But how do we know this? The same as any other historical account. The historians, they have tools to help them to see how an account is credible or reliable. Early sources close to the event, we have them. Eyewitness testimony, we have plenty of them. Embarrassing details, lots of them. Enemy witness, we have it. And multiple independent sources, check. We have all these tools the historians use to know that an account is credible and accurate. So how does the New Testament compare to other ancient sources? I didn't know this. This for me was a revelation. Just Alexander the Great conquered basically the whole known world. Between the original and the first surviving copies is four centuries, 400 years. Tacitus, Caesar, a thousand years before, before the original and the first surviving copies. Demosthenes, Herodotus, 1,400 years. Plato, 1,200 years. And the New Testament, 25 years. There's nothing like this in ancient sources. 25 years is extremely, extremely short period. And how well documented is the New Testament? Well, the New Testament has almost 6,000 copies. This is incredible, appalling compared to the other sources. The closest one is Homer with 1,800 copies. And then we have, for example, Caesar. We have 10 copies only. Alexander the Great, 17 copies. Plato, 7. Herodotus, 8. Demosthenes, 200 only. And the New Testament, almost 6,000 copies. This really puts into perspective how well stacked and how reliable, how well documented is the, the New Testament in comparison with other ancient sources. There's a cold case detective called James Warner Wallace, and he used to be a militant atheist. But then he started to apply his techniques and knowledge to the Gospels, and he realized how early and how reliable the Gospels are. And he makes a case for the Gospels, for the early Gospels, and he focuses on Luke. Luke writes the Gospel of Luke, and he writes Acts. And then Acts described the life of the apostles after Jesus ascended to heaven and then how they're preaching around, doing the their thing. And then Luke is very specific, very meticulous. And then we don't have, it's missing from his accounts, the destruction of the temple, which was in 70 AD. And then also the siege of Jerusalem, which was a huge event where people were getting crucified, people were starving. It was a huge event. Also from Acts is missing the death of James, Peter and Paul which happened between 61 and 65. So we don't have any of these extremely important accounts. And the reason is because it hadn't happened yet. Luke wrote Acts much earlier than that. So he cannot write about it. Also, uh, we have Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians quoting Luke as scripture. And we know that Luke is later than Mark. So Mark is around 45, 50. So we can really make a case for maybe 15, 20, 25 years maximum from between the crucifixion and the first gospel. This is extremely early in ancient history. William Lake Craig, he's a theologian, philosopher, and he writes, from the very nature of the case, the best historical sources were included in the New Testament. People who insist on evidence taken only from writings outside the New Testament don't understand what they're asking us to do. They are demanding that we ignore the earliest primary sources about Jesus in favor of sources that are later secondary and less reliable, which is just a crazy historic methodology. It's like a crime scene. You have a crime scene and then you have all the evidences, you put it in a box. You put the fingerprints, you put the murder weapon, you put all the witness account, we put photographs, we put maybe a blood glove or maybe a, a little piece of fabric or a hair. 
and then you put it all in the one box full of uh, the evidence. The most reliable evidence is, is there and they don't want you to solve the case with the stuff inside the box. So it's the same with the Bible. You have the best sources and it's all put into one cover, the Holy Bible. Here's where things turn to get a little more fun. This is the minimal facts approach. And this is a method that considers only data or facts that are basically granted for every single scholar or people that study this topic. And these are four of them. It's the death of Jesus by crucifixion, the empty tomb, post-resurrection appearances, and transformation of the apostles and conversion of the, the skeptic Paul and James. So we're looking for a hypothesis that can explain all these four facts. And now we're gonna go into detail to find out if each one is true. This is Bart Ehrman. He's a skeptic, he's an atheist, and he's a New Testament scholar. He's probably the most famous skeptic New Testament scholar. And he says, one of the most certain facts in the, of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. And we also have Jean Dominique Crossan. This is a skeptic as well. He's from the Jesus Seminar, and they're very skeptic, basically atheists. And he says, Jesus' day by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate is as sure as any historical fact can be. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, Paul says, For what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance. This is a rabbinical term. I receive and I pass on to you. And that Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to scriptures. So here we have the death of uh, Jesus. He was raised on the third day. This is a very old creed that was circulating. Some historians say that even within months of the cross. A Roman crucifixion was no joke. Consistent in three different steps. We have the scourging, we have the crucifixion, and then we have the final or death blow. First on the scourging, consists in a flag room, which is some kind of whip made of leather. It has some metal pieces on the front, some kind of claws, and some piece of bone, which is especially designed to remove all the flesh from the body. So a lot of people, they just bleed to death, maybe the intestines spill out. It was a brutal, brutal thing. And the crucifixion obviously is extremely excruciating, as a, what the word means. If somebody's gonna survive this situation, we have the third and final step, which is the death blow. We could be with a sword, with a spear, they put him on fire. Nobody's gonna walk out from a full Roman crucifixion. The empty tomb. How do we know this happened? Well, it was reported in the Gospel of John independently of the Synoptic Gospels and Acts. Women were the main witnesses, and under Jewish law, this was unacceptable. They will never make something up like this. Jewish leaders don't deny it. Actually, they try to explain it away. And we have the Jerusalem factor, which is that everything happened in Jerusalem. We have the crucifixion, we have the empty tomb, we have the resurrection, we have the appearances, we have the apostles preaching. It will be much harder to invent something if it's in the same place happening. And we also know the location of the tomb that used to belong to Joseph of Arimathea, one of the Pharisees. Also, the Toledo Jesu confirms it, and it's implied in the early creed in 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, Jesus died for our sins, and then he was raised on the third day. So, implying that there's an empty tomb there. There is a piece of evidence called the Nazareth inscription, and this is dated from the middle of the first century. And this is an edict from the Caesar saying that whoever steals a body will have the capital punishment. This could also add to the empty tomb when people were saying that disciples stole the bodies. This is another little line of evidence. And what about the appearances? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, which remember that this is a creed that it was circulating within two years of the cross. It says, and he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. And this is interesting to know. This is circulating very early, and he's basically telling people, if you don't believe it, go and ask them. This is all happening in Jerusalem. And then he says, although some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, which was another skeptic, and then to Paul, which is the person uh, passing this message. So it's very interesting how this, this creed is telling us all the appearances of Jesus one by one. So he appeared to individuals, to small groups, to big groups, to friends and foes. This is a very complete picture of the appearances. This is the skeptic Bart Thurman again, and he says, it's a historical fact that some of the Jesus followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead soon after his execution. Gar Ludemann, 
German uh, professor, he says, It may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. This is Paula Fredrickson. She's a Jewish historian. She's also a skeptic. And she writes, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say. And all the historic evidence we have afterwards to attest their conviction. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. But I do know as a historian that they must have seen something. So what kind of something did they see? Well, I tell you, the kind of something that will change some scared disciples into bold proclaimers of the faith and the kind of something that will change some skeptics into martyrs of the faith as well. So what they saw was the resurrected Jesus. What did Paul lose? Well, as they said, Paul had it made. He was a Roman citizen, which gives you a lot of rights and privileges. He was a Pharisee. He was from Tarsus, which is the cultural capital of the times. He spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, Latin and Greek, and he studied under Gamaliel, which he was like the, the main teacher as well of the time. So basically, he was the equivalent of his study in Harvard, and he made his doctorate in Oxford, and he had money, and he had it made. But he changed all that for what? Well, he changed it for all this. He was persecuted for years. He got five times 39 lashes. Three times he was shipwrecked. Three times he was beaten up with clubs. He was stoned and left for dead. He was incarcerated and ultimately martyred. So he definitely believed what he was preaching. What about the non-Christian sources? So here's a list of a few of the non-Christian sources, some of the extra biblical sources, Josephus and Tacitus being the most famous ones, but they all write things about Jesus and about his ministry. And remember, these are not Christian. These are, these are not even friends. And if we put a composite of extra biblical accounts, just, just a, a few of the things, we still can get to know a lot of Jesus. Jesus was born in the first third of the first century. These are not biblical sources. And he was born out of, out of wedlock. Obviously, they didn't believe the virgin birth. He gathered disciples, five are named. His ministry thought a number of controversial topics and intersected with somebody named John, who baptized a lot of his people. He was wise and performed wondrous deeds. He was arrested and crucified under Pontius Pilate, which this narrows the time gap between 26 and 36. His disciples stole the body. We have the empty tomb there. And despite his agonizing death, the movement of his followers did not die out. In fact, Shortly after the crucifixion, they claimed to see him rise from the dead, worshiping, sang hymns to him as if he was God and his messiahship has been vindicated. So this is very interesting how even the extra biblical sources give us like a, a good perspective, even not a friendly perspective but of Jesus and, and his ministry. This is one of my favorite parts, the opposing theories. And it's how the skeptics try to explain away all these facts. And this is a list of the very best, very best explanations they can come up with. But remember, these theories or hypotheses they offer, they must explain away each one of the facts. They have to explain the death of Jesus. They have to explain the empty tomb. They have to explain the appearances. And they have to explain the conversion of the skeptics. They all have to offer an explanation that covers all these facts. First, we have the hallucination theory. And remember, hallucinations are like dreams. They only happen on the mind of the person having them. Group hallucinations have never been recorded. Also, this one doesn't explain the empty tomb. It doesn't explain the conversion of the skeptics. The disciples, also we know that they touched, ate, and talked with Jesus. And nobody was expecting on the Jewish belief that uh, there's going to be a resurrected Messiah. They only look forward at the end of time for the resurrection. So this one is, is not a, an adequate explanation. The apparent death theory is the hypothesis that skeptics propose that Jesus didn't die with the crucifixion, with the flogging, with uh, being in a cold tomb, very, very damaged. So this, this is a very odd theory, but there's all other factors as well that they don't mention. There's no record of somebody ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. It doesn't explain some of the facts, like the conversion of the skeptics, James and Paul, and it doesn't explain the death account of Jesus that historically we have. Jesus was in no condition to move the two-ton stone and escape from the Roman guards. And after a full day of beating, flogging, crucifixion, under the hot sun, bleeding, Jesus couldn't have appeared to his disciples as the risen glorious Messiah. He wouldn't be like, wow, I can't wait to have a, one of those resurrected bodies on my own. They'll be like, let's take you to a hospital. Let's take you to Pelanomi. They'll probably finish the job there. 
the wrong tomb theory. This one's a little silly. The skeptics just say, maybe they went to the wrong tomb. It doesn't really matter if they went to the wrong tomb. Everybody knew where the right tomb was. All they have to do, the Pharisees, just to produce the body and just to show it around and say, it didn't happen. Also, it doesn't explain the multiple appearances. It doesn't explain the transformation of the disciples, how they became super bold and courageous, and the conversion of the skeptics. And also miss the words, he was risen, found in every manuscript. They didn't think that he was risen. They didn't assume he was risen. They saw the risen Jesus. It's a big difference. The conspiracy theory. This is the claim that the early Christians stole the body and made up the whole resurrection story. This one's really bad. The early Christians had nothing to win and everything to lose. These kind of things only happen if you are going to win money or power or sex. And the early Christians didn't win any of those things. Also, according to Josephus, the testimony of women was inadmissible in a court of law. So the only reason why somebody will make up the story and put the women finding the empty tomb is because the women found the empty tomb. This is the kind of stuff that you will never make up. The disciples also couldn't pass the Roman guards and even the guards admitted that something strange, miraculous happened and they have to be paid to say otherwise. It doesn't explain the multiple appearances, the transformation of the disciples or the conversion of the skeptics. Also, the apostles gave their life for this, so we know they're honest. Liars make poor martyrs. The legend theory. Whoever come up with this one, I think is at least very uninformed. In order to have a legend, we need to have at least two or three generations. And all these accounts are within the one generation, with the same generation, and so people are still alive. This theory doesn't deal with any of the facts. It doesn't deal with the empty tomb, it doesn't deal with the appearances, it doesn't deal with the conversion of skeptics, etc. etc. And on the old creed from 1 Corinthians 3.15, it attests about the miracles of Christ and the resurrection, meaning that it was all part of the story from the very beginning. So this one is just, let's say, uninformed. All right. So those were the very best theories we have. Now we're going to move on to the very worst. These are the alternative theories. The first one to try to explain away the resurrection is aliens. On Ancient Aliens website mentions that an unknown artist seems to be telling us that these flying saucers were present during the death of Jesus. The faces likely mean that these craft were piloted by people or beings that seem to play a central role in the event and they must have been part of the crucifixion story. Hmm, how I didn't think of that before. The next one is the lettuce theory. And this one is similar to the wrong tomb theory. And apparently some gardener was working at the tomb where Jesus was buried. And there was a lot of curious people walking around and they were stepping all over their newly planted lettuce seeds. So he got very angry and he removed Jesus' body. He put it somewhere else. And then when the visitors came, saw the empty tomb, they assumed that Jesus was risen from the dead. You can't take this theory seriously. Even just by the name, the lettuce theory. Maybe if it was cabbage, but not lettuce. The twin brother theory. This one is my favorite. Apparently, an unknown identical twin, separated at birth, who remained hidden up all his life, grew up independently from Jesus, came back just at the time of the crucifixion, stole Jesus' body, he presented himself to the disciples who they thought that he was Jesus, risen from the dead. We're not even going to go how to debunk these theories. And these theories may seem ridiculous, but they are ridiculous. But they really illustrate the desperate lengths that skeptics will go to try to explain away the resurrection. So why the resurrection is the best explanation? First, we have great explanatory scope. This means that he explains all of the facts. He has great explanatory power, he explains each of the facts very well. It is plausible, especially given the historical context of Jesus' life and claims. The resurrection serves as divine confirmation of those claims, and it is not ad hoc or contrived. That means that we didn't make stuff up just to fix the immediate problem. To wrap it up, what does all this mean? So if Jesus resurrected, he is exactly who he said he is. It confirms the truth of scripture, guarantees that God will also raise us from the dead. Our sins have been paid in full and we are justified. The gospel is true, guarantees Jesus' return. Everything he thought is true. Christians have true hope and purpose and Jesus Christ will judge the world in righteousness. Jesus said, 
I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do we believe this? That's the question we must ask ourselves and, and act accordingly. Thank you so much for watching.